Oh, here we go. Hi, everyone. I'm Arlene with Beacons of Balance, and this is our guest speaker, Simon Quadulo. Is that right? Am I pronouncing that right? You did, Quadula? yes. Quadula. Thank you. Okay. Linda is not with us today. She has a conflict with scheduling, so you'll just have to deal with me <laughs> in any event. So I want to introduce Simon to you. He is an ordained spiritualist minister, a healer and a teacher. Actually, he's a former Benedictine monk, which I can't wait to talk about that, <laughs> and has spent most of his life in so the social work field until he went from being a monk to a social worker in the social field. And then he was director and manager of the Beverly Hills Ballet. He was born, he felt he was born a medium, and he was a gra he's a graduate of the School of Spiritual Healing in Lilydale, which is Lilydale, New York. So, Simon now. Tell us, how did you go from being a, a Benedictine monk? And how long were you a Benedictine monk for? I, I was uh, connected for 10 years. I was in vows for um, three years, I think. Um, left just before solemn vows. Had gone in very young. In those days, it was uh, pre-Vatican II. So I'm dating myself a little bit. And uh, it was something that I always knew that I I <laughs> wanted to do. And, and our family was not. I mean, we're Catholic, but um, no one went to church. But, uh, oh. you know, like I was about five years old and I remember people saying, well, what do you want to do, you know, when you grow up? And I was like, well, I want to be a brother for six years. I want to be a priest for six years and I want to be a mi missionary for six years. I had no idea what any of that was about. Um, I think that's reflective. I, uh, now I look back and I think that was kind of past lives that I, I uh, was connecting to. And mm -hmm. when I've done some past life stuff with people, it always comes up that I, I was a, uh, a monk clergy. I always is always connected with um, past lives with me. So I think at five, I was picking that up. And, um, you know, they say that children up to around the age of five see spirit, hear spirit. And we should always encourage children, uh, but all too often we we play them down and say, "Oh, you know, don't say that. That's that, that's you know, that's not okay." Um, well, and I I definitely believe that because going back to Catholicism, I mean, that's when you had your first sacrament was they called it what the age of reason, and that was like a seven. Exactly. And exactly. you know, a lot of a lot of the culture follows that. Like children, once they hit seven, they kind of lose they lose that grasp, you know. And, One of the other things that I didn't put down in my bio is that I'm a single parent. And uh, in raising my daughter, who's now 28, uh, or will be 28, when she saw spirit, I always encouraged her. And, how wonderful. What yeah, a gift. Yeah. And um, she, she was very connected, you know, and that's, that's that beauty, you know, at three and four, you know, they see spirit. Yeah. Does she still have that connection? Um, we don't lose it. We don't lose it, but many times uh, people choose not to, you know, she, when she hit that teenage years, she's like, Papa, I just want to be normal like my friends. <laughs> <laughs> but she's an incredible healer and we don't lose that, you know. You know, in terms of mediumship and, you know, we're all born psychic. We're all born psychic and anybody Correct. can develop this gift. It's one of the things that I teach weekly in a class that I do. It's the case of developing and i talk about the language of spirit and it's developing that language so that we understand it i know for myself as a you know as a very young person i was constantly told that i was sensitive oh you're too sensitive you're too sensitive and 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 it became like something that i became ashamed of Sure. And I think that we now are starting to understand that being sensitive can be a beautiful thing the in path you know, yes, is, yes. is that connection. And, and when we're empathic, we have all these wonderful gifts and we're not aware of them. And, and people can be somewhat afraid of us as well because well, of that. Well, I think we, you know, I don't know your age and that, but we're probably from around the same sort of arena uh, time frame that back then, you know, you just didn't talk about it as a child or whatever. I had deja vu like every day. I didn't know what it was. And I couldn't go to my parents. They'd probably knock me off the side of my head and say, you crying. You know what I mean? So you just kind of kept it here. I had heard of the definition between or psychic and medium. They say a psychic is more that could tell you like past, uh, present, future. They use tarot cards and different things. 
and a medium is more involved with the afterlife and connecting with the souls that have crossed over and bringing messages. They say a medium can be both medium and a psychic, but a psychic is not, it's just psychic. They're not necessarily a medium. I don't know if that holds any truth for you or rings true or no. Um, well, well, I believe, uh, and, and there's lots of different feelings about this, but I believe that we can all be a medium. It is a matter of training. It's just like anybody can play the piano, but not everybody is going to be a concert pianist. And I think that's where the difference is. So we all have the ability. We are all psychic, okay? And developing the medium is is a is a is a process of work that we have to bring about. I agree, I agree with you because we all get our intuition. We all get that. You know, I've I've facilitated different groups in that, and of course, when you get that hit, that gut instinct is your initial. And I always say, everybody, rely on that. That's your truth. But then we go up here to our brain and we start analyzing and extrapolating and pulling it apart and trying to make sense of it all. Yeah. I, I always say that, you know, like till about the age <laughs> of seven, we are like sponges. And and then what happens, we send children off to school and then everything is left brain and the right brain where intuition lives, where creativity, which, where the uh, in, intuitiveness begins is pushed down. Mm -hmm. um, and the left brain is raised. So it's about education and, and that. And so I do feel like it's done purposely because uh, we don't want to have everybody not having to rely on government or religion to follow their path. In fact, all we have to do is go within and we can do what's best for ourselves. Then. So are you more involved with mediumship as far as when you do your you know, readings and so forth? Are you more connected? with spirit from the other side, or do you also cross over to give people insight to what's going on in their life or be it, you know, everybody wants to know about relationships and jobs and their finances, it seems, you know? So, so as a registered medium in Lilydale, it's a two-year process that we go through, um, so to speak, we're vetted uh, during those two years. There are so many services and, and things that we have to, and and we're judged, um, and and then we're passed. And so, as a registered medium in Lilydale, it is uh, my job to to give evidence of spirit, and um, so I'm an evidential medium. Now, in terms of the psychic, <laughs> when we say hello to our our, our client. You know, good morning. How are you? Um, that's psychic. We're getting into the psychic. So there's this kind of flow that goes back and forth. And I love never... you're doing this. This is the balance. See, that's what yeah. means the balance. <laughs> yeah, and and so there's always that back and forth. You know, we'll we'll go in and out. And um, I I believe that we shouldn't put so much emphasis on whether that's psychic or that's mediumistic because they all blend together. So how long were you again? How long were you a Benedictine monk? About right. 10 years, yeah, connected. About 10 years. Years. And, yeah, um, it was a process. And, so what uh, had made you um, change? Because then you went into social work right after that? No, I, um, <laughs> as a monk, I was in charge of different things. I, I was in charge of the apple orchard and the Christmas tree farm. And, and so it was a lot of that. And then at one point, we operated a retreat house and the older monks wanted a younger monk to come in because we were giving retreats to teenagers. And so they wanted someone that they could relate to. And so I was brought into that. And that began, I think that social work kind of, that was, I think the beginning. I had taken social work and, and psychology in college. So th this was a, a good mix for me and that was the beginning of it. But after I left the monastery, I found myself connected to St. Vincent's Hospital in the village, Greenwich Village, which isn't there any longer, uh, shame. And um, they had one of the one of the first alcoholic uh, programs, detox programs. And so I was involved in that for many years, uh, working with alcoholics and, and then moved to the psych floor and mm -hmm. then eventually day hospital. So I, I worked both with psychiatric patients and alcohol and drug abuse. That's very, very challenging. It is. It very is. Because we know that uh, the disease of alcoholism is about denial. Mm -hmm. And so you have to break through that. And the person has to give up drinking for themselves, not for their loved exactly. ones. Exactly. Exactly.
And so where where were you? Where was the monastery? Uh, the monastery. Well, I, they had bounced us a little bit. So the house that I belonged to was in Newton, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, I did my novitiate in Morristown, New Jersey, and I had gone to school in Indiana as well, the St. Meinrad's, another Benedictine house. So, uh, How long were you involved with social? So when you got out, you were in social work. How long were you involved with that? About 15 years. Uh huh. And then uh, my partner and I, he was a ballet dancer, and we opened a, a ballet school in the Hamptons, and, and it became very successful. And then I had to, he was like, I need help. And I was kind of like getting burnt out. At that point, I was director of a home for emotionally and mentally challenged adults. And so I then became a manager for uh, Southampton Ballet and Dance yeah. Arts, which was our school and, and ballet company. So as you, because you said you got burnt out, how did you, um, in working in that field, because that's heavy duty, how did you bring balance to yourself? What brought you um, from what you were working with and then bringing, not bringing it home, but coming home to your partner and to that business? How did you bring yourself? One of the things that we learned very early on was to leave it at work. So to leave all those feelings, everything that was going on, to leave it at work and not to bring it home. Don't talk about it. Let it go. And that was very important. And and then, of course, as an empath, it's so important to have time alone, you know, just just to have that time alone, what, whatever it is that you're doing, to just have time alone so that you can kind of regain and balance yourself again. Sure, because that, and you're working with that energy, and that energy is very heavy duty. Yeah. yeah. I, I know it well. <laughs> from past, I was thinking you do, yes. From, from past uh, situations that. So then... So um, in your bio, it said that you were a born medium. So had you always, did you always delve into it? Did you acknowledge it and use it or? Well, very early, I, I used to uh, see angels and, and feel them around and, and, um, and they would tell me things. And so I remember once saying to a cousin something, and I guess it it was something he was doing and, and they ha were acknowledging it and he was not happy with that he had been found out and and he said they're going to lock you up you're going to you keep talking like this and they're going to lock you up and i was about you seven. Saying yeah. it to you. oh yeah i was about seven or eight and that and i just shut it down so you shut it off yeah that yeah, was just too frightening for me yeah. and, and and i just kind of shut it down and so when did you open back up when did you open back up to it and uh <laughs> In Catholicism, we talk about the delayed vocation, you know, and, and I feel like in many ways I was that delayed vocation. I really didn't get back into this work maybe 20 years ago, and then I started looking at it again. And I'd gone to a, a, a psychic medium, and 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 we were sitting there, and, and I could hear his thoughts. I knew what he was thinking, and he stopped, and he goes you're clairaudient. And I thought, oh, what's that? I had no idea this was the terminology he was using. And he's like, you could do what I'm doing. And I'm like, oh, I don't think so. And he's like, yes, you could, you know. <laughs> so he was that encouraging force for me to start looking at what, what these gifts, you know, we talk about gifts, some prefer to use the word abilities. And and that's when I started looking at it a little bit. You said you had mentioned also that you saw, do you actually see physically? Do you see when you saw angels, did you see them? Well, I mean, angels appear different ways, of course. But So we um, talk about two ways of seeing things uh, as a clairvoyant. Um, and one is where we physically see them. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's what I'm asking. And, yeah. Or right. you can and see the them. other is we see them in our mind's eye. Mm -hmm. And so many times when I'm doing a reading, I can see the loved one and I can describe what they look like. And and then the sitter will say, Yes, that's exactly uh, you know the way they looked, and that's exactly the way they were. Uh, because of my psych background, the way spirit works with me many times is to give me personality. Uh, and so I will give the sitter their loved one's personality and all the intricate parts of that personality. So are you seeing it more in your in your in your mind, the visual, well, or are you actually 
seeing physicality, seeing them. It's, it's all of that. So I'm clairvoyant. So I see spirit mostly in my mind's eye. I'm clairaudio. So I hear spirit. I'm clairsentient. I feel yeah, it. Yeah. And then uh, claircognizance is that's kind of knowing. You don't know why you know it, but you just know it. And that's the that's kind of the newest clair. Um, only around maybe 20 years, 25 years. Um, the others are much older. And there are, there are other class as well, scent. You know, you can smell spirit. You know. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I've had that. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes the scent isn't that pleasant. And they, yeah, they play tricks with you. Yeah. <laughs> I've had that happen. So that's pretty good. Cool. A cigar smoker, you know, on the other side. Yes, yeah, definitely. Anyway, was your partner... Was he into the spirit? He was very uh, spiritual, but we didn't talk about it. You know, we didn't talk about it in those days. We talked about ballet. We talked about the kids under our care. Um, but it wasn't until the end of his life that he started to talk about that. And he would say, I, I know you're very sensitive. He always gave me more credit than I thought that I, I should have. Um, because I thought he was also very sensitive. He was able to see spirit towards the end of his life. He described his mother, his birth mother had passed and we were headed down to Florida. And he said to me, once we got down there, he said, there's been a spirit around. And I thought, oh my God, this guy's really going bonkers. <laughs> and and um, I wasn't in, in, involved in any of this yet. And he's like, I can't tell who they are. I just know they're about 350 pounds and they're um, they've been with us since the car ride. And I thought, oh, I think we've got to get him checked, you know. Well, in those days, they didn't have cell phones. And we until we got back to New York, we had gone to Florida for a vacation. We found out that his mother, that birth mother had passed during that time that he saw her. Um, wow. And so uh, I became aware how sensitive he was. Were you there while he was, when he crossed? Were you, were you there? Were you... I was, yes, I was. And um interestingly enough our daughter was there and she was two and a half and once he crossed um she was uh, i had brought her upstairs and and he downstairs and and uh, when i got up to her my friend was watching her she was crying and screaming and and this was a child that never did any of that and she was saying i want to go with dad in the spaceship she, she saw, saw she yeah, saw she the light and and attributed the light in a does she have so, any recall of that or i don't at two and a half i don't think she has recollection of that because yeah. my father appeared to my son when he was three and i talked to him about it and of course he's an adult now but he he doesn't he, he doesn't remember but it was very vivid it was very yeah it frightened right. him because he woke up you know and he he explained he saw him totally <laughs> right right and he, he was three coming down the stairs. He, he was screaming. And I, of course, was alarmed. He said, and I heard the front door opening. This is, it was a whole, whole thing going on, energy. And he right. said, mine, don't let the man with the uniform in the truck get me. And what three, he didn't know those, he didn't know the words. So I was yes. just, like, and my father had an oil business and he always wore a uniform and he, he loved his trucks. So I knew that's who it was. And I just picked him up and I said, don't worry, it's okay. And yeah. It was fine. You know, he was just checking in with, you know, to see him. <laughs> right. Right. It's pretty amazing. But they do. They do see. Yeah. And that's why I say I think children are so we have to pay so much attention to them and give them the credit for that because we either open them up or we close them down. So listeners out there or viewers, listeners, both. It is important for your children, grandchildren or whatever to keep that line of communication don't mock them and laugh at them they have a lot of information talk to them it's really amazing and important so i'm going to ask you some little personal questions here as far as was it easier for you to come out or which was harder easier for you to come out um to your family as far as being a psychic medium or coming out to saying that um you were gay and i don't mean to, no offense or anything but you know i mean it's just you know life um, was it more I, difficult one or the other? <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't have to deal with, um, uh, I really didn't have to deal with <laughs> either of them when it came to oh, family. Okay. Uh, I remember my parents showing up um, to my first apartment and I was already living with a, a young man and um, they, they were having coffee or my father was having coffee, my mother and I, um, my partner wasn't there. And, and my father said, well, what do you doing today and i'm like well i'm painting the bedroom and he's like my father was a painter he said i'll help you 
And so we moved the one queen size bed that so he knew, you know, um, and he was very Italian guy. You know, he just he loved me because I was his son and it didn't matter. You know, my mother had a little bit more problem with that, I have to say. She was always hoping, you know, that I would find a good woman. <laughs> <laughs> a good Wall Street. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> my last partner, we were together for 20 years. And uh -huh. even after his death, my mother was still hoping. <laughs> really? Um, yeah, yeah. So it was hard for her. And she felt like it would make it easier for me if I, you know, would be straight and that I would mm -hmm. have a woman. And she didn't understand what was important was that I'd be who I am and how yeah. I, can, you know. She was also very uh, psychic. She had the gift of telepathy and, and we would communicate that way. Many times we didn't need a phone, you know. It was quite interesting. Both my sisters are. I don't know about my brother and we don't talk about it. So I'm not sure where he stands with that. How do they feel about you being a, a psychic medium? How were they accepting of it, your sister and brother? Yeah, yeah, I think my sisters are very accepting. I've given readings to them and to other family members. So I I think for the most part, you know, some of them said, well, you, we knew that you were always that way. Well, I don't know what they saw that I didn't know, but, you know, a big Italian family. And I, I think they were very accepting that way. Were you, where were you in the lineage with them? Were you the eldest, medium or middle? I'm the second oldest. Yeah, I'm the where oldest you? son. The old old. A lot of times, you know, they'll, well, like you said, we do have the ability, but a lot of times family members will have it, you know, and they're together. So um, the message, what I would like also being um, a medium and that, how do you bring balance to um, people that you read for and, and share? How does, how do you think doing uh, mediumship brings balance to people or how could it bring balance? I, I think that. The key word, actually, um, and, and as a medium, this is what I feel that we bring to the sitter is healing. I feel that it is important for us to be able to connect the spirit world with them, because many times the connections were not when the, you know, perhaps the father left and um, and that there was no emotions that were ever expressed. No, I love you. No, I'm proud of you. And so when you connect those two together, uh, lots of times there are apologies that come through from the spirit world. And they're very specific, you know. And that is what I feel as mediums in Lilydale. I feel that I, I give that sitter those connections, that healing begins. There are many times there will be somebody that, has passed from a suicide. And sometimes it's a seemingly a suicide, you know, drug use. Right. And when I speak with the spirit, they will say, I I've used this drug a million times. And I, 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 this is the first time I'm on the other side. I woke up, I'm on the other side. So they didn't understand. And, and um, the sitter will say, we wondered, we, you know, we didn't think that they would have committed suicide. They were happy. And, yeah. and so, you know, we have these things that are laced with drugs, fentanyl, and a lot of that. But to, to be able to make that connection, and so th then that parent knows that the child didn't actively take their life. You, that's such a gift that you're giving somebody, and that I think is is the word that I would use. And perhaps then there is a balancing out of emotions and yeah. feelings. How wonderful! No, it's true. And that's, that's a very profound message because I think many of us leave. I know I did for a long time. Um, and I thought I had resolved. My father passed when I was 18. I was very angry. And um, yeah, he was an alcoholic. And intellectually, I analyzed and I said the word, I thought I forgave him, but it was, it was in here. <laughs> it took quite right. a while. But then when I made that realization, it was, it was quick and it, the signs I had were incredible. Yeah. So I think for our viewers and our listeners, it's never too late. And just because a soul crosses over and you haven't had closure, you could still do that. I would also say to our listeners, it's so important to release those feelings now while your loved ones are still. Oh, definitely. Yeah. So that you don't have to use a medium to as an intermediate to get that message through. Yes. Yeah. You know, tell somebody that you love them. 
You know, it sounds like such a simple thing, but it's if we're not raised, for people. Lots, yeah, if we're not raised with uh, expressing our feelings, then we don't. We keep them down and we and we think it's normal uh, just not to talk about it. I don't know if you know the words of Mother Teresa, but I remember years back watching news reporters that went over to India to help her. Or actually, they were doing a report. And, you know, news reporters, they don't emote. They, they just kind of give the news. They're focused and whatever. But I could see it in their eyes when they were talking about what they had witnessed and everything. And they said to her before they left, they said, what could we do when we go back to the States to help you, me over here and, and do the call? And she looked at them. She said, forget me. Forget what you've seen. She said, you go into the nucleus of your own family and you heal. She said, if you cannot do that, see, I remember these words. She goes, if you cannot do that, you can't do anything for anyone and there'll never be world peace. Those words never left me. In fact, I have it stitched on a pillow. And yeah. I I remember it was so sobering to me. I, I you know, finished that watching it. And I said to myself, holy crow. I mean, I had a, you know, I have a big, enormous amount of friends and, you know, and everybody would get along. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, my own nucleus of my immediate family, which many, you know, they're fractured and things are left unsaid. You have anger, you know, all this. And I'm like, how true? How true? When we do that, then we begin to heal us. And that's what mediumship is about. The other thing about mediumship is, is it is a path to finding ourselves. And in anything that we do, is is about giving back to ourselves. Everything that anybody does um, is so important that they find the path to themselves so that they understand who they are. And in doing that, then they're giving to everybody because we're all connected. We know that now. We know that this globe that we live in is really quite small. And, and we are all connected in this web to one another. So what we do for ourselves, we're doing for others. The good that we do for ourselves, we do for others. Definitely. So Definitely. I just say, yeah, we're all one. I mean, if you're in a room with anybody, I mean, as we're breathing, we're breathing in each other, <laughs> right? We have share the same breath. It's in and out. It doesn't matter. Right. So people, That's if they're right. so small brain that they don't think that, you know, it's kind of crazy. Simon, I know you're busy and I really appreciate you taking the time for us and share this. It's so wonderful. And down below, we will have your link, um, Rev Simon, right? At yahoo.com. That's the best way yes. to contact you. You're at Lilydale. So we'll have that information. Reach out to Simon, have a reading with them. It'd be wonderful. And I want to thank all our listeners for um, spending time with us today and for watching, listening. And please subscribe. Um, like, leave comments, tell us what you like, don't like, or whatever would like to hear in the future. And as I always say, um, remember to be the change you'd like to be, because that's where it begins. And from our hearts to yours, in total love, peace, harmony, that's what it's all about. I always say, if we have inner peace, we have it all. You don't need anything else. So till next time, namaste. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye now.